Good evening. My name is Eldante Winston. I am a member of the NOMAS chapter here at MIT. Tonight, uh, we welcome you to the fourth annual and first virtual NOMA sponsored lecture. This evening, we are delighted to have Chris and Dominic Leong of Leong, Leong Architects. Leong Leong is an award-winning architecture firm and creative agency that uses the power of design to advance visionary social agendas. The office practices in the fields of architecture, urbanism, and culture on a global scale, exploring innovative ideas and strategies to discover new ways to engage the city in its ever-changing cultural context. Founded in 2009, Chris and Dominic have developed their practice into what they call a cultural enterprise, an assemblage of talented people from different backgrounds and diverse experiences. This approach to building a practice reveals itself in their architecture, where they work to create spaces of convergence and meaningful social experiences. The interest in the social dimension of architecture is grounded in the realization that architecture is a product of its context. Leong Leong has received a wide range of recognition for their work, including the 2010 New Practice Award from the American Institute of Architects, the Architectural League of New York's Emergence Voices Award, and they were recognized as a design vanguard by Architectural Record. Over the years, the office has completed projects of varying scales and in varying geographies. In 2014, the firm designed the U.S. Pavilion for the 14th Venice Architecture Biennale, for which they were lauded for their ability to negotiate surface, beauty, and materiality. The Los Angeles LGBT Center's Anita May Rosenstein's campus in Hollywood was praised as an intergenerational campus that would bring hope for thousands where people could come together to create a better, healthier, and more equal world. The firm's collaboration with fashion brand 3.1 Philip Lim resulted in the brand's flagship store in Seoul, where the material palette and interior sequence create an environment for unexpected and curious experiences. The practice that Christopher and Dominic have established is one that places value on design, innovation, and community, while maintaining an active curiosity that comes with knowing what you do not know. I'd like to take this time to thank Chris and Dominic and also welcome them. Uh, before uh, they begin, please be aware that uh, questions can be uh, entered into the Facebook or the web portal. Uh, thank you, Chris and Dominic. Great. <clears throat> Thanks, Eldante. We're really excited to give this lecture uh, from our cohabitation in, uh, in, uh, in Brooklyn. Um, we're, I'm going to read something um, just because we thought it was a good way to um, get our feet wet in the Zoom lecture format. Um, so we're, we're yeah, yeah. Yeah. Get the, is it the, got that? Okay. Okay. Um, <clears throat> so we're happy to be speaking tonight at MIT and are grateful for the support from NOMA. Uh, in addition to having the opportunity to gather our thoughts in the midst of our global pandemic, it is also meaningful for us to be speaking at MIT for the NOMA lecture because our father, who's Chinese American and Hawaiian, it actually attended MIT in the late 60s during another tumultuous era, the countercultural revolution, the Vietnam War, the civil rights movement. And in a way, our story of architecture starts here when our father, who is now a practicing architect, was pursuing his postgraduate research in systems design. At some point in his time at MIT, which involved the early days of computation, machine learning, and applications like driverless cars, he began to question the institution's relationship to the military industrial complex at the height of the Vietnam War. A feeling that design and technology should help build a society, not destroy it, led him towards the field of architecture. He ended up leaving MIT and went back to the land to Northern California, where he settled in Napa Valley and started building cabinets. He eventually met our mom, a public school teacher in the town, and he had, they had, Chris and me. When we were about four or five, he designed and built our family. 
house, which they still live in, and which is also his architecture studio. So you fast forward to 2020, and we're here in a crisis of another kind, which some also call war, and similar conversations are foregrounded again about racial and social inequity, our failed government, and the absence of social infrastructures that care for people in need. And again, we are pressed to reassess the systems and values which have led us into such a catastrophic situation. As some, mostly the privileged, are replaying the same conversations about staying in our cities or escaping to the countryside, we also fantasize about new ways of living more locally, building more sustainable communities. We know that none of this is new, it just seems more urgent again. The biggest difference now is that our ecological survival is perilous. Capitalism is more proper, pr prosperous for some, and we actually have an internet. Meanwhile, we still have our physical bodies and we live in physical spaces together, reconfiguring the insides of our homes around new rituals of work, childcare, medical care, play, leisure, wellness, social connection. As time is no longer measured by our movement through space, it becomes either non-existent or more, or more oppressive as one day bleeds into the next. And in this sense, architecture and design matters more than ever as we straddle the physical and the virtual. We're left to wonder what the city will be like when we reemerge together. What will, we, what will we leave behind from our old lives? What will we take with us from our lives in quarantine? And how will we rethink of our, how will we think of architecture? Even if we find a vaccine soon, what hopes and dreams will, bring with, will we bring with us into this new reality? And how will this collective trauma shape our vision of the future? When we were putting this lecture together, we realized uh, there's a lot to take with us into the future. Uh, for the lucky ones, we have uh, reconnected with our loved ones, forged new coalitions of care, and reassessed the value of our social lives. There's also a history of ideas and conversations um, that haven't been fully actualized yet, both for the discipline of architecture and also our practice from the last 10 years. And at the same time, we're also experiencing a kind of professional ego death, questioning the preconceived notions of how we practice, how we want to relate to the world now. So this lecture moves through stories about our insides and outsides, biographical, spatial, and even existential. A successful ego death is a ruthless confrontation with your immediate, with one's immediate reality and the narratives which define oneself and how we understand the world. It can be filled with resistance and fear of letting go of one reality to move into another. So this is where we will start here on day 165 since the first documented case of COVID and the 40th day of our self-isolation. We are here on this graph, charting the distance from others relative to disposable income. Um, the idea of a vast difference in experiences uh, related to um, the economics of social distancing. Chris and I are currently hunkered down inside a townhouse in Clinton Hill, where staff are scattered throughout the city and one actually in Texas. Um, we're lucky that me and my partner have enough space that Chris could come cohabitate with us along with his two kids who stay with us every other week. The first week of the quarantine, my partner Dina got very sick with what we suspect was COVID, which immediately put us into a hypervigilant triage mode while we isolated her in the bedroom. As it became clear that our healthcare system was breaking down and getting medical attention was not an option, we committed to the idea that we would not go to a hospital unless her breathing started to compromise her oxygen levels. Then for the next 10 days, we brought her food and liquids in the bedroom and isolated her until her fever dropped for another three days. Out of necessity, our lifestyle and domestic space turned into a practice of biotrust. While we closely monitored Dina's temperature and oxygen levels with a pulse oximeter, we cleaned everything profusely and argued about protocols for leaving and re-entering the house. We didn't go outside for a couple of weeks as we waited for the rest of New York to catch up to the protocols of social distancing. Finally, Dina has fully recovered and we've acclimated to our new domestic life and the new social contract of biotrust of our post-COVID future. 
So this is where we wanted to start um, thinking about um, the scale of our personal space in relationship to our social space. And this diagram, um, which is um, indicating it's, it's come, it comes from a theory of prox proximetrics, um, which identify different spheres of uh, space relative to an individual out to personal space, social space, and public space. And I think the ironic thing about this um, that we're all experiencing is that there, according to this theory, um, there's a threshold of four feet, which defines uh, the separation between uh, personal space and social space. Um, so we were thinking a lot about how um, the insides and outsides of our of our world have changed radically, um, specifically uh, our domestic uh, lives. Uh, previously, um, our lives were sort of a combination of the activities that we did at home, but also um, which were scattered throughout the city: healthcare, play, work, childcare, fitness, social, social activities, eating, school, um, and then now we're in this kind of convergence of this, the, our, you know, our normal activities sort of collapsing into the home. And all of a sudden there's a sort of new relationship between inside and outside of our, of our kind of normal lives. And we were kind of sort of speculating on what this means is thinking of uh, the topology of a post COVID future. Um, and with this sort of um, um, uncertainty of how we will go back to work, how we will go back to school, um, how we will start to interact again in the city, um, and understanding that these new topologies or these new inside and outsides will be defined uh, both by spatial constraints of physical distance, but also uh, immunoprivilege, um, tracing of, of immunity, um, tracking of temperature, et cetera. And that the topology of our lives will actually become quite complex and quite contingent and quite quite temporal. Um, so as I think as we move back out into the city um, and we've reshaped our homes, um, that inevitably reshapes our, our relationship to the city and the shape of the city and the spaces of the city. And in the same time also reshapes our, our relationship between ourselves and others. Um, and so we were starting to just think about um, the history of ideas um, from uh, the Vitruvian man through uh, radical 60s architecture to uh, moments uh, that we've all seen of um, testing booths and this sort of, uh, you know, new relationships of inside and outside and the spaces that uh, define how we interact with, uh, with each other. Um, understanding that the body is fundamentally a topological um, um, system, actually the shape of a torus, um, and how if we start to think about um, this situation, and it's fundamentally uh, a spatial situation um, that we are going to have to uh, navigate um, as we reemerge. So this is actually Chris and I in 2009 when we first started our practice. Um, we were living in a townhouse in Chelsea that we were also renovating. This is us now sitting at our uh, dining room table, four feet apart. Um, we've always thought about our practice, not so much as a trajectory that goes from uh, the discipline to the profession and to your context, um, but we've always thought about it as a feedback loop, um, taking with us certain disciplinary obsessions, uh, understandings of, of how to operate in the world as a profession, and how um, our context is a large um, influence on what ideas are, are relevant uh, from, the, from the kind of discipline. And so if we think of this kind of flywheel um, and the new context in which we're entering into, um, it inevitably puts into question uh, what disciplinary ideas uh, are still relevant, um, how we work professionally. And so one of the things we um, realized early on in our practice uh, working with um, um, 
number of different clients was that the traditional um, kind of services that uh, an architect might um, offer was really limiting in that uh, a number of opportunities were coming to us uh, more so uh, for the way we think as architects in the sort of fuzzy boundaries of um, architectural thinking that lead more into um, uh, strategic thinking, building narratives, research, experience, and insights. Um, so for you know the last uh, five or six years, um, that you've been building out a, a new model of practice, and um, in a way, this pandemic has has uh, forced this kind of professional ego death on us to rethink what the shape of our practice is, moving from um, a traditional practice into something that might be more uh, of a network of creative collaborators. And I think in this moment, um, it's really a time to reassess what, um, what the critical issues of our time are. Um, I think for the most part, we've thought a lot about the intersection between technology and humanism. And uh, we're looking uh, to, to reshape um, how we think of collectivity at the intersection of technology, humanism, but also um, ecology. So uh, the, the mission statement for Liang Liang is an architecture uh, and design student in New York. We work with diverse clients to build cultural resonance and advance social agendas within the built environment, as Andante said. And this idea of this new shape of practice, thinking of it as a creative consultancy, um, also uh, advancing social agendas at the intersection of technology, ecology, and humanism. You can just keep going. Okay. And I think one of the things that we've um, thought about uh, putting this lecture together, as I mentioned, is what, what, do we, what do we take with us from our past projects, from our past conversations? And um, through the course of the uh, last um, few years, we've really been thinking about the value of space and the, the realization that physical space is, is, has for a long time not been the primary medium of organizing people information and power. Um, and so what are, um, as we move into this, um, this near future, um, what, what are these kind of conditions of collectivity um, do we need to take into account uh, to continue to evolve and flourish? And thinking of the social, we really like this um, quote from Bruno Latour that the social really only exists um, when we can uh, identify new associations that are being made, which is um, something I think that we're all experiencing now. So we'll start with the project. Um, this is a project we did in 2014. Um, started in 2013, but we did in 2014. Um, it's a global project um, at a global scale. Um, and the project was uh, Office Us um, for the 2014 uh, Architecture Venice Architecture Biennale um, for the U.S. Pavilion. Click again. Um, the project was curated by MIT's Anna Miliaki, uh, Ashley Schaefer of Praxis, and um, Ava Frank of Storefront at the time, and now currently the director here at the Architectural Association. Um, and the project was really twofold. It was one part looking back into the history of American architecture, um, the American architecture, the corporate architecture firm and the, the architectural products of the United States um, and how they were disseminated around the world. And secondly, it was a, an experiment, an architectural new model of architectural practice um, to create a practice within the pavilion of the, um, the US pavilion um, with eight fellows for a duration of six months um, living in Venice and working out of the pavilion. Um, but we really thought about the history of the architecture office and how it was formed and shaped by a sort of a certain, um, say, homogeneity, but that how now there's a kind of shift and a need for a more of a, a diversity and a kind of different way of thinking about both people and ideas. Um, and so 
the project really started also with us looking at the kind of as exhibition designers thinking about what the fundamentals of the architectural office were um, and this idea of the table um, which is probably the one the one the one element that is is consistent across time across different technologies um, was really one of the the elements um, that organized this pavilion and this project the table itself was both a, a vitrine uh, a toolkit um, and a work surface and it was a, in a sense a figure that organized this uh, neo-palladian pavilion and created a kind of unified space um, space for tools a space for working um, space for uh, display and interaction a space for domesticity um, and a space of play um, and a space of engagement that's the kitchen this is the kitchen yeah <laughs> It's also the kind of, uh, yeah, convergence of programs within the context of uh, the U.S. Pavilion. Um, but also, I think it was fundamentally a, a network as well, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, the, I mean, the idea that we had eight fellows operating out of, the, out, of the, out of Venice, but also connecting with a global network of offices, larger offices, smaller offices, experts, um, really set in a, in a way kind of prescient for where we are now and since we're all working remotely we're all working um, across many different platforms and this was a project that really um, <laughs> in a lot of ways foreshadowed so we thought we'd, we'd, we'd ask Ava one of the curators of the pavilion who's now the current director of the um, of the architectural association to give us some thoughts and reflections on the project and where things are going so we're gonna pull Ava up right now. Hold on. Uh, see if I can do this. Oh, gonna find it. There we go. Okay. Here's Ava. Hello. Um, welcome to the uh, AA um, virtual space, which um, what we have done is to try to produce a, a place for us to discuss and to debate and and to understand what are the kind of new possibilities of a life uh, of teaching and learning online and and so as part of one of our units uh, of design units Lara and Frederick as part of our, our diploma program they created this space that um, teaches everyone how to start creating virtual environments so sometimes we meet people here and and we can have conversations and discussions in physical space that allow us to somehow have a kind of a different relationship with each other than the one that the flattening of Zoom or Google Hangouts or Teams or any other of these uh, conference uh, platforms produce. So there's a special quality here that I want to show you around. So why don't you follow me? Yes. I mean, I think we are, um, we are all living in a moment in which many of the uh, experimental propositions that we did a few years ago are now part of our reality. Office Us was a model of working and collaborating in which people all around the globe would connect to digital platforms to uh, produce work that otherwise we could we could not uh, have imagined. Um, and, and what at that time was kind of radical and difficult because of uh, matters of connectivity and population now are uh, incredibly, incredibly commonplace, right? So um, it's not so long ago, it's just six years ago, but what at that point was radical, now it's just necessary. So um, what I think was important about that model is that it, it tried to reinvent the idea of architectural practice and to think of that as a form of entrepreneurship in which any single act of design can be thought and understood as, a, as an act of, uh, of, of creative action. And I think that that is what we need probably today and we will need in the next years and probably decades as we come out of this incredible situation. Um. So for the past six months, we've been working on uh, another type of um, 
collaborative space that deals with both the virtual and the physical. Um, it's based in New York. Um, it's a project that uh, is part laboratory, part studio, part gallery for artists working in the realm of virtual reality, augmented reality, and mixed reality. And the project is called Onyx Studio. It's a collaboration between New Inc., a cultural incubator led by the New Museum for artists, uh, technologists, and, um, and designers, and Onassis Foundation uh, based out of Athens. Um, and as we're all sitting here currently, sitting in our homes, taking part in this lecture via Zoom, um, we are now participants uh, in new ways, seeking new ways of relating to one another, relating to ourselves through portals of technology. Um, as Douglas Copeland said, the present and the future now coexist at the same time. And that I think what this new reality has kind of brought to us is the idea that how and when accelerated this kind of idea of what um, kind of virtual technology um, is for us, maybe in the same way that, you know, cinema and the internet really expanded our, our thinking. Um, I think potentially the idea of the virtual reality and augmented reality is really going to be transformative as well. Um, and so the project itself is pretty simple. The challenge the brief was to create a, uh, a space out of a gallery with a limited budget um, that's both workspace, but also uh, performance space, um, a space for 12 artists to work, um, collaborate, um, but also test ideas and then um, present them to the public in different forms uh, before, you know, they're, they're working in, in different, in different contexts, in different galleries, um, different, in different mediums. Um, and so it's really a place to really bring the kind of virtual into the physical and, uh, and, and, and present it. Um, but the project itself is, is uh, you know, oftentimes I think VR spaces currently are pretty ad hoc environments. Um, it's a sort of still a burgeoning um, space, um, but there's unique characteristics and requirements to prototype with this technology, both physical and digital. Um, and we've grown accustomed to, you know, purpose-built black boxes and theaters uh, to create to create engaging content and dynamic productions for the performing arts, but what will these spaces demand in the context of virtual reality? Um, so this is a space that really puts that to the test to start to think about what is a space of experience um, of, of of production of theater. Um, there's demo spaces. This is an acoustic room. Um, there's other demo spaces that are both laboratories, but also display spaces for people to experience um, and workspaces um, and hangout spaces. Um, but I think primarily it's a space which you walk in um, that can be many things. It's sort of a, a, a Swiss army knife of, um, of, 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 of a space. So we asked Karen, who's the, director of Onyx Studio, but also um, the, the deputy director of um, the new museum to, to share her thoughts. Let's, uh, let's see what she has to say. I think the idea, we thought, we thought um, having conversations at this point in time was a lot more interesting than having monologues. Give some context. Okay. Give some context. Um, you know, the new museum started the cultural incubator New Inc. six years ago. And even from the very start, we always had um, a ton of members really lean into mixed realities. Um, and so, you know, that's been manifested in, you know, premieres at Tribeca and Sundance, um, as well as just you know, being really on the bleeding edge of how to use these technologies as artistic mediums um, and very much uh, around the idea of storytelling and oftentimes around um, storytelling that is um, around marginalized communities. So we've been seeing uh, these types of artists work in ways that are both culturally and socially impactful 
And it's just something um, that we embrace uh, because that's always been part of um, Newing's mission. You know, one of the things which I think makes this space so interesting is that it's neither um, theater nor museum. You know, I, I'm calling it something like a third space. It's something in between where, um, you know, these artists, so much of it is about demoing and beta testing, seeing the technology works. Does it work with one player, two players? Um, you know, how, um, how are the interfaces um, working and what needs to be shifted? So it's this kind of constant iterative process and so creating a space where artists can actually do that work before they premiere it at a festival or in a gallery space or in a pop-up, um, I think is going to be kind of game-changing uh, for this small yet growing community um, here in New York City. And, you know, and I think um, spaces like um, Onyx Studio um, will really perhaps even become the norm because of its intimacy, we are also able to regulate it in a way where I think people would feel um, that it's, you know, very safe and secure to come through. I mean, the other thing that I've been really thinking about too is the idea of what is a room, right? Because all of a sudden we we're talking about, you know, chat rooms and breakout rooms and you know, this terminology that we're using virtually and how does that pivot back into physical space and do we need to start making new types of relationships when we use the word, you know, a simple word like room. I, I, I think going into um, our near term future, kind of a kind of parts, the idea of durability, the idea of efficiency, they're really going to rise to the very, very top. Um, Zoom thing is kind of tricky. <laughs> yeah. So the next project is, is really a temporal project. Um, it's a project about uh, bringing people together and creating a collective experience. Um, where design uh, plays, a, plays a part, but it's much less about the physicality of design, but more of the kind of shared social component of, of design. Um, it's a project called 24 by 24 by 24, in which we brought 24 architects together on the occasion of the solstice in 2018. Um, we held the event at Storefront for Art and Architecture, uh, which is a space which, as many of you know, holds a lot of um, significance for experimentation, exchange of ideas. Um, it's a very porous space. It's a space that opens up onto the street um, that makes it, you know, really public space and actually a pretty amazing space to hold an event like this, which happened over 24 hours continuously. Um, we invited these 24 firms. It was organized, We Young Young was just one of the organizers. There were six other organizers of this. So it was really a collective organization. And we asked each of the firms to produce an object, a seat, um, to organize one hour as a convening of people. Um, and that was pretty much it. Um, these were some of, the, some of the seats that were developed and they were brought to the, brought to the space um, it's so, also kind of a constraint on budget, right? Like really to make something with the least amount of uh, resources. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and also to reach out not just to architects, but also to designers, industrial designers, artists, like people of different disciplines to bring them together. Um, so at 6 p.m. on June 20th, uh, was the first hour. This is Benjamin Cadena, Studio Cadena, one of the organizers. He set up a ceremony of unveiling the vinyl on the front of the wall. This is Sam Chermayev, who made Clans Casino and mixed gin tonics, like he was sitting on his porch in Cape Cod. Um, this is Corey Dumont, one of the organizers who had a silent disco at midnight. Formless Finder at 1 a.m. hosted a, a talk on land art. Um, Chen Chen and Kai Williams, industrial designers in Brooklyn, they actually made their own Doritos and uh, Monster Energy drink, as well as plain 
sublime and play against a backdrop of the sublime sun on the solstice. This is Charlotte Hyman Herrero, um, designers who staged an opera around uh, a 1960s film devoted to a mollusk. They served escargot and uh, chocolate chip cookies molded in shells and we drank coffee out of uh, the shells. At six in the morning, uh, Leong Leong with Chalet Magazine hosted a happy hour in which we poured drinks, but also gave uh, 21 special objects, special items, like a phone call from Howard's dad or an incense or mix tape, right? a mixtape. <laughs> um, people turned out. Um, this is a Brent Knapp. Um, and um, they did yoga at seven in the morning. Um, Katie Stout vacuumed. Mitch McEwen did a karaoke night and did a CNC milled grandma sofa that was covered in vinyl plastic. Um, and at the conclusion, it was sort of just a gathering and Ava is famous for her paellas, uh, cooked one of her last paellas in New York City for everyone and everybody ate and uh, everyone hung out. And I think it was really a project in which it was really about the idea of, of holding space um, and the idea of simply holding space for people is actually a way of, of shaping it, which was, which was a really powerful idea. Um, just down the street, should only be two, two E's in there. <laughs> um, should mention our office is in Chinatown on the Bowery, uh, Bowery and Grand, probably four blocks from storefront, uh, five blocks from this location in Chinatown. And we're kind of at the intersection of Nolita and Chinatown. And a lot of our work actually we do in the neighborhood. Um, we've collaborated a lot with uh, Asian Americans for Equality, uh, who's started off as an activist group um, in Chinatown um, when they noticed there was projects in Chinatown that were going to house Chinese residents without any Chinese representation or um, Asian American representation in the construction of those projects. Um, and so they started as a civil rights organization, but they've grown into becoming an advocacy group, a, um, one of the largest affordable housing developers in lower Manhattan, but they also represent um, not just the American community, but many um, underserved communities and um, minority communities throughout New York. Um, and this was the project uh, in the neighborhood in Chinatown in Olita um, in 2016. And as we were thinking about the project, we're also reflecting on the development and the growth within the city. Um, thinking about neighborhoods like Chelsea in which the High Line, um, which is really, as many people know, a kind of lightning rod for a certain type of development. And at this point with Hudson Yards, it's kind of a, a mega development. Um, and, you know, it begs certain questions about, you know, who is this for? Um, what is the representation? Who's the designers? Um, and and what, what is at stake? In, in the shaping of our kind of urban realm. Um, but this is the project here. It's a city owned piece of property um, right in Nolita. And for, for a while it's been leased by a private individual who's for a while it was just a sculpture garden not accessible to the public, but as his lease went up, it became a community garden, actually a pretty beautiful community garden called the Elizabeth Street Garden. Um, and so it was a really, uh, challenging project in the sense of the the city was asking and needing affordable housing, which is tremendous, you know, something tremendously in need, um, and actually senior affordable housing. And so we were initially not going to do the project, but Asian Americans for Equality, who's in the neighborhood, said, look, we don't want to stand by. We want to put, put forth something that we really believe in. If this project is going to get built, we want to put something that we believe in, even if we have to break the rules to do something that maybe is more connected to the community than might otherwise be. And so our strategy was pretty simple. Um, there's a garden and there's a home for about 105 potential seniors. And our goal was to really create a kind of sense of collectivity around the ground, around the garden, um, by you know, leaving the garden intact as much as possible, but also contextualizing it, working within the, the, the local um, context, the, the, the sort of walk up, um, historical context, about 20,000 square foot lot. And this was what could have been built as of right. But the approach here was to really subdivide the lot and give over half of the lot and make it a community garden 
in um, perpetuity, which Appy was willing to do because they care more about the kind of product of the neighborhood and the, and the constituents of the neighborhood than profit. Um, we lifted the building up in the middle, divided the massing, and really the strategy here was to create as much of a kind of muse as possible with a south facing window. Um, and it yielded, um, if not the exactly the same amount of units, it yielded like 55% open space, which is something that, um, you know, would have been a kind of a really nice kind of offering within, within the neighborhood. Um, and so here the strategy was really us thinking about unlocking a lot of these kind of internal block spaces that create more of a network of green spaces um, with the south facing exposure um, and with the ground floor in which storefront for an architecture was going to be one of the tenants. There was going to be a senior, um, senior center on the ground floor um, and really creating a space that would be open to the public and having a continuous um, space both indoors um, during the winter time and, and outdoors during the summertime. So it's sort of a year round space, passive house um, construction, um, trying to think about it being as sustainable as possible. I think one of the really important things about this project was that we approached it um, as a coalition of uh, people who had a stake in the neighborhood. So storefront, AFI, um, and really thought of it as a pilot project for another model of uh, development that did not think of equitable um, public space in opposition to housing, which quite often they are, it's, it's either or. And the importance that architects are at the table to use design to solve what um, might politically be thought of, thought of as uh, conflicting, um, conflicting agendas. Um, um. So we, we reached out to Thomas Yu, the, the code uh, director of AFI to kind of check in with him and see what was happening in Chinatown, what's going on in Chinatown, what were his thoughts on the critical uh, issues related to um, the Chinese American community um, and also what the future might hold for um, housing development in the city. Um, so, you know, as a, we're one of those uh, unique hybrids where we have uh, housing tenant organizers, you know, advocating for the tenants, and we're also a nonprofit affordable housing landlord. Uh, with the, the coronavirus shelter in place measures, you have the entire neighborhood shut down, no restaurants, nothing. And so they're all laid off. And now we're seeing uh, where folks are avoiding the streets in Chinatown. Uh, you're noticing now the, the uh, undercurrent of Asian homelessness, you know, uh, surfacing right out of the open. If you walk through Chinatown, you'll see a lot of that. They, these were folks who uh, formerly uh, rented beds together with, you know, uh, non-family uh, individuals, uh, shared uh, rooms, you know, in a lot of the tenement buildings. And without income, they're not able to rent these places anymore. So they're, they're, you see them wandering the street and looking for food pantries, you know, to, to find food. And uh, it, it's more than ever now that after this crisis, we have to figure out ways to uh, create flexible shared uh, housing space because in the past it took a, uh, a long time and it sometimes fell on deaf ears when we tell uh, policymakers and uh, city government that hey there's like a, a Asian poverty problem there's an Asian homeless problem and so because it wasn't visible uh, that wasn't put on the forefront but now we're seeing it you know because of the crisis the perception and internal perceptions of where Asian Americans stand in American society, uh, being that kind of perpetual foreign agent, even though you know many of them are Americans, you know, and um, and and it's it's going to add to like the kind of trauma as well as like the kind of cultural and historical memory of uh, these ethnic enclaves if they still exist. Uh, uh, we always talk about. Well, what makes a neighborhood authentic, uh, 
what makes it real, uh, especially in uh, when a lot of people were grappling this, more in the lens of gentrification previously, uh, this, this may speed it up, you know. Mm -hmm. um, you're going to have an ownership that has, has zero relation to, right. to tenants and uh, storefronts. Yeah. And so it, it may get commercialized. It may lose a lot of that gritty feel to it. And I hope it doesn't die, but uh, we really don't know what's going to happen. And, but then society is shut down because uh, of how we take care of our weakest link in this case, you know? Uh, it, it goes to, to show like, yeah, we don't care for them. We're all kind of on the same boat. Mm -hmm. uh, then we have to take a serious look at how do we make uh, housing better for everyone and, and uh, how do we do it right in the sense so that it, it's, uh, it satisfies all these competing needs. So I think um, what our conversation with Thomas was insightful in terms of understanding what the reality is for um, um, Chinatown um, and a vulnerable community going through um, this this pandemic um, and this idea of what are the needs that we haven't met. Uh, both at the level of policy, but also how that affects what is possible at the level of architecture um, with the understanding that um, housing, affordable housing is, is a very constraint-based um, typology. Um, but we also, you know, are thinking a lot about our um, experience um, working on the Anita Mae Rosenstein campus uh, in Hollywood, which we started in 2014. Um, and it was really a, a, um, a rewarding project, um, understanding what the potential of architecture is to um, offer new ways of, of living uh, specifically for the LGBT community. Um, a large part of um, the Los Angeles LGBT organizations um, efforts are focused on providing um, social services, health services, wellness services, and housing, um, senior housing, youth housing. Um, a large component of this project was the youth center, um, which serves um, a vulnerable uh, community um, that um, are not experience a lot of trauma in more traditional environments, um, which results in a high level of uh, youth homeless living in Hollywood. Um, so the, the, the brief uh, that we were given really was about expanding on the mission of the center, uh, which was actually founded by social workers um, uh, following the um, social movements um, after the Stonewall riots and a number of uh, other uh, important moments within um, uh, LGBTQ history. And the organization is multifaceted. The project was, you know, in a lot of ways talked about as being a sort of utopian um, um, effort. And we thought that um, it was such a unique opportunity um, to think about how architecture could speak for a community that otherwise um, um, very, very, uh, not very often ha has a chance to have a civic presence. And it was thought that we would have to provide more services immediately for Hollywood, Los Angeles. Um, it was also thought of as a new kind of similar global leadership for the LGBT community. Um, just to move through it quickly, um, there's a number of um, um, facilities that already exist in Hollywood that the center has been running for the last 50 years, uh, which includes senior housing, a youth center, a health clinic, administration, um, and HIV testing. And this project uh, was conceived of as a new model of, of living, uh, which would consolidate a number of those social services on a single campus um, this is the, the lot in Hollywood, 
which is about a 70,000 square foot lot um, just across the street from the village at Ed Gould, which is um, one of the center's cultural venues, uh, which has a theater and a gallery, uh, the existing municipal building that was on the, on the property. And we thought a lot about um, what this project um, means uh, ourselves not identifying as queer. Um, how do how as architects do we build uh, a, and, and care for a, a, another community? Um, and it, we were we didn't really approach the project in any sense of uh, thinking about necessarily queer queer theory or queer aesthetics, but more about how to meet the needs that uh, were communicated to us by the the, um, um, the staff and the, the organization. And one of the um, interesting moments when we were doing research um, for other uh, LGBT serving uh, facilities as we went to the Harvey Milk School, which was intentionally designed not to look like a typical high school, uh, precisely because um, a lot of the youth were looking for a new environment um, to escape um, or to find a sanctuary from um, environments that didn't accept them. And we thought that is really the power of architecture to create these new organizations, these new spaces, to create new associations for how we can relate to our, ourselves and each other. One of the big issues uh, that we encountered was security. This is the current youth center, or the, the, the youth center which uh, existed prior to the campus, um, which is an opaque building, a discrete entrance that provides um, a certain degree of safety for uh, people to enter and exit uh, with discretion. Um, and I think, you know, sometimes architecture is thought of as um, a kind of pinnacle of actualization, uh, thinking about Maslow's hierarchy of needs, uh, more, more as a, a network of needs and that architecture, um, architecture needs to um, address all of these in a non-hierarchical way from um, uh, creating belonging, creating uh, safety, um, creating um, senses of community and ultimately um, allowing a, a collectivity to uh, thrive and flourish. The program is uh, super complex. Um, what is that little thing? <laughs> complex, <laughs> complex center. We actually added a, uh, uh, a added a program to the brief which didn't exist, which was. Um, an event space and a space for convening uh, because we um, thought that this campus should not only meet the needs of the community, but also have a space that was an interface to the city that allowed for intersections between the LGBTQ community and the, the city at large, which could um, both be a space of joy and celebration um, and also um, convergence. Um, and so the, at the heart of the project is really this um, narrative about uh, a sanctuary and a home, but also an institution and a civic presence. One of the biggest um, moves in the project was to think of it not as a monolithic uh, block with a, with a giant courtyard, but really try to break up the mass um, almost like a map building to use the courtyards to create connectivity between the, the kind of complex programs. And the most radical move, which seems really banal, was that we submerged the parking in order to allow the campus and the spaces to connect directly to the scale of the sidewalk and um, and um, um, reactivate what was otherwise a um, more commercial neighborhood with um, with the, the community. Um, very complex program. It's actually almost like a city within a city. Uh, we thought about the, the need to accommodate uh, difference uh, between the different um, uh, clientele, youth, seniors, administration, um, social service, academic programs, and to use uh, the, the poor, a kind of porous plinth to connect uh, these different programs, but also separate them. Um, and so the building kind of uh, modulates between a more domestic one story scale and then a more institutional scale. And the courtyards you can see here of the youth center, uh, which provides safe outdoor space um, 
for homeless youth, which is actually a, a huge um, a need. And the urbanistic um, move of the campus really tries to knit back into the, the cultural center across the street and create a new plaza. The idea that this building doesn't have one singular vantage point that is a, a kind of iconic gesture, but it has a, uh, a number of different kind of identities of these kind of glass volumes that are uh, unified with um, our kind of porous plinth it's entrance to the youth center and the flex space uh, which has a roof deck um, and a, um, a space for uh, exhibition space um, which um, starts to incorporate um, some of the history of, of this LGBT community into uh, that space. And currently on phase two, the senior housing, 100 units of senior housing, uh, almost uh, complete. Um, and, and again, um, we're really sort of considering what, what, it, what does it mean to create housing for seniors and uh, a vulnerable uh, population um, with a certain degree of density. And so moving back down towards this sort of domestic scale, um, we're working on a, a house in Hancock Park, also in Los Angeles, which is a reconfiguration of a 1970s suburban home that uh, is uh, for a family that um, really wanted to rethink their domestic life in very uh, specific terms, in which we were really excited about. Um, they're a family that um, collects art, but they actually didn't want to have any art in their house except for video art. Um, but the ambition was to think about the family home as a sanctuary. Um, and what does that mean um, to re rethink uh, how a family of four lives in a 1970s suburban home? And it was because of the, the um, historic guidelines, we could actually, we um, only renovate a certain portion of the house. So it necessitated a relationship to context, which wasn't about erasing, but actually uh, embracing the kind of weirdness of the suburban home, but start to redefine the boundaries of the footprint of the home and reorder um, the existing lot to um, create um, sort of a typological ambiguity between insides and outsides. Um, Keep going. Mm -hmm. So you can see here the um, the footprint of the existing house, which we thought of um, as a boundary that could be reconfigured relative to the boundary of the lot, and working with the constraint that we could only redefine or reconfigure 50, uh, 49 percent of the footprint. Um, we thought about inserting this figure, uh, which would start to create um, a communal space for the family, as well as um, four um, outdoor rooms that would be extensions of the, uh, the, the bedrooms on the right, um, the entry courtyard, and the uh, kitchen and, and living area um, towards, towards the north. Um, so this entry to the um, new house is defined by this, um, this wall, which creates a courtyard and a kind of procession into an outdoor room or lobby, um, which is then uh, punctuated by a media room um, encased in this sort of uh, um, uh, stucco, um, black stucco and continuous stucco wall that uh, extends into the backyard and starts to define um, uh, outdoor room relative to the dining room, which is actually thought of more as a co-working space um, than a uh, traditional dining room. And then the pool, the existing pool, which also gets redefined relative to the, the curving wall um, spaces of play. We can hear the 7 p.m. 
um, shout out to the healthcare workers, which means we're almost times up here. <laughs> um, so some views of the exterior and the sort of in interventions into the suburban type. And the last project um, we we'll talk about is um, inspired by this concept uh, that Mich Michel Foucault wrote about in an essay called The Technologies of the Self. And he was thinking about um, technologies or practices or conducts, um, operations on their own um, that uh, historically we've um, kind of performed on ourselves um, to attain a certain state of happiness, purity, wisdom, perfection, and immortality. And we really thought that it was, it was an interesting text um, in how we understand contemporary uh, trends related to wellness and self-care. And I think one of the critical aspects of Foucault's definition of technology, the self, was that when he goes back and, uh, and talks about the Roman bathhouse um, as a space of, of self-care, that the care for oneself is related to the care for others. And by extension, it also relates to the care of the this, this city. Um, so we thought it's important to understand that, um, that there is no self-care. Um, care is, is an act of uh, mutuality between um, two or more people. So we did a number of projects that sort of meditated on um, what are in a way primitive technologies or tools um, that would enable an interaction between two people. So uh, a tiffin for carrying food, a sensor for uh, meditating, a mortar and pestle for um, preparing food, uh, meditation blocks. Um, all of this particular project was made out of uh, Himalayan salt, um, which is a, a kind of ubiquitous um, uh, material of, of kind of wellness uh, culture. And that led into a project that we recently completed at Mac Center for an exhibition called Soft Schindler, curated by Mimi Zeiger, which we thought the narrative of domesticity um, and binary definitions of how the Schindler House um, and how the history of the Schindler House has, has kind of erased the presence of Pauline Schindler and her um, interventions on uh, the, this kind of modern masterpiece. And so rethinking these, the binaries of domesticity, we were interested in fermentation as a, a act or practice which blurred uh, the inside and outside. These are three vessels that we designed out of stone which were placed in the hearth of, of the, the Schindler house, which is sort of like an outdoor living room. And over the course of three months, we invited a collaboration with two fermentation experts um, who concocted um, recipes, um, one based on uh, Japanese miso and uh, shio, and the other uh, a, um, a citrus-based fermentation. So we'll play this, this short video.
so this these projects are a series of projects part of a larger ongoing reflection on a concept that we've been thinking about uh, rethinking domesticity we call it, we call it the, the house before departure from earth um, and so we've designed these these artifacts and these objects um, in a way to define this new domesticity without actually defining the space um, the most um, the largest the largest uh, new type that we've designed is the float tank which was part of a um, uh, research on um, uh, uh, rethinking the, the the act of bathing as actually an act of deep meditation and uh, exploration of the human unconscious. And um, we built a prototype uh, for a group show in, in, in Bilbao, uh, Guggenheim curated by Troy Terrian called um, Architecture Effects, uh, in which we um, built this prototype that was uh, to function as a, a, a solar furnace that would um, um, essentially allow the water to be heated uh, to 98 degrees and uh, filled with salt from a nearby salt um, quarry north of Bilbao. Um, and luckily uh, I was able to um, float in it for, for a tiny bit. Um, but we wanted, we went back and talked to Troy and we, we were really thinking about um, the idea of our, our domestic spaces as sanctuaries now and um, what might have seemed um, like so sort of, um, rather eccentric um, ideas of these new objects. Um, could they actually um, so lead to new ways of, of living in, in a quarantine or I did a, a kind of survey with some of my colleagues of what other museums were doing in this era of pandemic, particularly from a digital perspective. Obviously, that's kind of all there was, or all there kind of is at the moment in terms of content possibilities. And it seems like there's this uh, vast arms race to both digitize, but then also to carve out space around modalities of healing. I think there's it's been in the zeitgeist for years now, and sometimes it takes um, a pandemic, I guess, to crystallize those things that are floating in the air, but, um, but that maybe mainstream institutions that have existing momentum and missions and so on are unable to, to invest in wholly um, until they're forced to. And I think that's what we're. I think that's what we're seeing is we're realizing that um, issues of things like mental health um, are now at the forefront because we're all dealing with them. We're all trapped in our homes with our kids and our cats, um, and have no means of escape, and are being fed um, a fire hose of fear on a daily basis that we can't turn off. Um, and it's literally a matter of life and death, um, biologically, psychically, economically, all of the above. Um, people are turning inside, and I think what that means for architecture is people are going to scrutinize their architecture in ways that they never have before, and they're also going to activate physical space in ways that architects haven't been doing for them. So there, I think there's a space, a, a, physical, a white space to be owned by the architectural field that is not going to be ownable because there isn't the expertise, there isn't the education, except in very, very tiny fringe sectors. And I think that area is ritual. I think it's literally how do we activate physical space? How do we design and activate physical space in a way that is able to tap into some of the experiences that people are giving themselves now with downloadable apps or weird YouTube videos they're watching or you know whatever it is they're growing in their herb gardens that they want to start eating for the first time. But historically, these are typically times that people migrate to things like mysticism or things where basically like the ontological blinders that serve us in times of normalcy have to come off because we have to change the way we think in order to survive. So we went, we went pretty deep with Troy, um, but I think what he, he, he outlined was, um, was, was particularly relevant in terms of the degree to which um, um, 
we can rethink um, a lot of the preconceived uh, notions of what architecture practice um, can do. And just to wrap up, we wanted to leave on a quote we recently read, which um, we thought was particularly relevant uh, from Aisha Ahmad. Um, now more than ever, we must abandon the performative and embrace the authentic. Our essential mental shifts require humility and patience focused on real eternal change. These human transformations will be honest, raw, ugly, hopeful, frustrated, beautiful, and divine. And they will be slower than keener academics are used to. Be slow, let this distract you, let it change how you think about how you see the world, because the world is our work. And, and so may this tragedy tear down all our faulty assumptions and give us the courage of bold new ideas. And so we wanted to leave you with uh, a manifesto um, for a professional ego death. Um, we think it, it's a time to uh, really question um, what it means to be an architect. Um, so what does it mean to think like a strategist to clarify critical paths? What does it mean to think like an entrepreneur to uh, unlock latent potential? What does it mean to think like a, a, a brand that communicates stories and identities? What about a hacker that can hybridize types and tools or even a shaman to conjure cosmological consciousness? Maybe even an artist to create new aesthetic experiences, a poet that can use language to liberate, even an engineer to design concrete solutions. Think about what it means to be an organism to cultivate symbiosis. And what does it mean to be a caregiver to meet others' needs? Thank you. Thank you, Chris and Dominic for a wonderful talk. Uh, at this moment, we are going to open up to, uh, for questions and answers. Um, if you are on uh, Facebook, just type your comments into the, the questions or your questions into the comments. If you're wa watching on the uh, webinar, uh, there is a comment or question box for you to enter. Uh, all questions will be fielded and uh, relayed to our two speakers uh, uh, by Alice, who is a member of our uh, NOMAS and uh, April, uh, who will be in the background. So again, Chris and Dominic, thank you uh, very much. And please uh, fill in at those comments with questions. Thank you. Thank you all, Dante, for the introduction. Um, I also want to take the time to say thank you to Chris and Dominic for putting together such a thoughtful and responsive lecture and for including so many voices in your talk. Uh, it's a really important moment to be engaging with issues which ground us in the present as well as for thinking about the future. So thank you. Um, so we've been uh, gathering questions from Slido and Facebook and we'll continue to do so throughout this Q&A session. Our first question reads, what are your thoughts on Karen Wan's proposition that the room as we know it may no longer exist? I mean, in a way, it hasn't existed for a while. If you think about the fact that we straddle, we've been straddling the virtual and the physical um, um, for a long time. But I, I think it was it was interesting that you brought that up relative to um, how we were thinking, how we were thinking about insides and outsides and new topologies of space that might not be defined by uh, physical. Um, parameters, which are typically the, the medium of architecture, um, but will, I think, be defined by a number of other um, uh, factors and technologies that I think go beyond just like virtuality, but even um, the way we um, are able to identify um, um, what a room is for a certain group of people that um, could be based on like Immunity, for example. Um, so I, th I think it's an interesting thing to to um, reflect on. I've been thinking a lot about, um, you know, not just the idea of, of a room, but of a boundary. Um, I mean, one of the diagrams we didn't actually get to here was this idea that we live in this space together. I live in Dominic's house temporarily with his partner, with my kids. 
um, and our notions of space are constantly shifting and constantly pushing against one another. And so while the physical room, um, you know, is in a sense finite, you know, our, the way in which we fill space or use space um, is, is really being, being tested and, and challenged in terms of acoustics and sensitivity. So I think, you know, we're, we're, we're confronted with these kind of virtual boundaries, but also these physical boundaries. And I think there's just this new sense of kind of awareness of, of our physical presence around others um, that I think this kind of current context is really um, brought to bear. So I think it's a really interesting question to be addressed. Okay, um, our next question reads, how have you changed your communication style slash design methodology within your office throughout the COVID-19 situation and remote work? Well, I, I mean, we use Slack a lot. <laughs> I think it's putting the bird also the, you know, another, like everything's being tested right now, you know, but I think communication is one of those things, certainly like, I feel like our communication has in a sense improved a lot just in a kind of interpersonal way. Um, as partners, um, I would like to think as an office we're communicating um, differently. I mean, who would have thought that we would have been like seven weeks into working and not ever being in the, phys in the same physical space that's not a challenge anybody would have necessarily put themselves to, but I think we're actually fully functional as a practice right now working on projects. And I think it's, it's super challenging. And I mean, everyone is aware of the, the challenges of working under these, under this kind of stress and with the kind of demand. Um, but it puts the onus on being much clearer in terms of how we communicate um, to one another and be, I think, open to, uh, hearing and listening, I think, much more greatly um, because of the kind of like immediacy of how we need to get. Yeah, I mean, I think it goes back to this idea of like, there's actually a lot of things that we're experiencing now, which we wanna, we wanna bring with us. Um, and I think to a certain degree, we're actually very productive in ways that we weren't before. Um, partly because we have to, I mean, the over communication, obviously like, becomes taxing, but I think we've kind of found a flow um, in the right um, amount of communication. Um, but yeah, overall, I think we just check in more um, with, our st with our staff um, more frequently. Um, and I think the fact that there's a higher degree of, at least from my experience, focus um, being physically isolated because every every conversation that that i have is is uninterrupted um which i find refreshing in one ways um but yeah you know at the same time like i think zoom is such a terrible interface like it's like i think there's just going to be so so much uh hopefully like new ux design that comes out of this I mean, just putting putting this lecture together, uh, working off of VPN, um, we're like, oh yeah, we have plenty of time. And then like, you know, 20 minutes before we're still trying to like, you know, download off the VPN. So yeah, there's definitely like these inherent bottlenecks that are, you know, everyone's experiencing them. But I, I would say though that, that on another level, um, being, being able to like reconnect with collaborators and clients, that kind of communication um, has been really interesting and, and, um, and, uh, and helpful and enriching. Um, so I think that's, that's one positive aspect is like how, how to um, like reinvigorate um, a network of people that you might not do on such a regular basis. Okay, thank you. Um, the next question comes from Nari. She asks, she says, thank you for grounding your lecture in our current reality. It is appreciated on the topic of death of egos and transforming architecture from a one man show into a collective practice. How does I, this idea manifest within your studio and office? Um, well, we, like I was, we were discussing, um, we're thinking of this new shape of practice that um, for now we're calling XL, um, which is, 
something that was more internal to what we were doing at Liang Liang, but maybe expanded the typical um, expertise of what people think architects do. And it dealt with strategy. And, and we worked with a number of different organizations and companies just doing thought partnership, which isn't necessarily legible from the outside, um, from, our, from how we communicate our practice. And I think going, going through this experience, um, we realized that it has a lot of value um, and it's something that we should um, make more legible to, to the world, um, both um, for the sake of um, creating new, like a new, a, new, um, a new space to explore that might not have the, the definition of what it means to be an architect as baggage. Um, and so in, in a way it's, it's, um, we were just thinking like, what, what would be the opposite of relatively speaking, the opposite of what we do now? Like if, if now it's a partnership, the opposite would be more of a co collective network of, um, creative collaborators that are interdisciplinary. Um, some of which we've worked on in past projects, um, others that we're developing relationships with and thinking of this, um, more of a, a network of, of um, collaborators um, is something that, you know, honestly, we're, we're still exploring it. We don't, we don't really know exactly um, what shape it'll take, um, but we just have certain intentions that we want to explore and see, and see what happens. Uh, the next question reads, what is possible for you in LA that is not possible in New York and vice versa? How might this change based on COVID-19? Uh, I wish I could ask a follow-up clarifying question, but I guess that's not possible. Um, I, I guess, there, I mean, there's different ways you could answer that. Um, I assume the question is related to like actually built architecture. Um, I mean, there's very obvious differences that LA has more space, LA is less dense, um, LA is more typologically diverse, um, LA has a different climate, um, which all leads to a different type of architecture. There's also different building systems. Um, I think going back to the premise of our practice, which is understanding how context influences um, our concept of what we do as a practice, but also what kind of architecture we make. Um, I think it's interesting to think about maybe expanding the question a little bit. Um, what is the local and what is the global and how drastically that uh, conversation has evolved over the last 10 years. And um, I would say there's a reemergence of, of conversations about locality. Um, and so I'm curious, I'm just, I'm fascinated how architecture, which, um, you know, over the last 15 to 20 years uh, was so, um, so much riding the wave of globalism. Um, what are the new conversations that are gonna emerge around a super local, um, practice. Um, and so being in New York, it's, 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 um, it's an interesting situation because, you know, we do work in New York, but by virtue of being in New York, we've done work all over, all over the world, um, including Los Angeles. And so um, we'll see what happens. I mean, I'm definitely not answering the question. Um, but I think it's, I think things will change in terms of like where, where and how far architects might work from where they're located. Um, okay, so the next question reads, what is your ethical responsibility in choosing your clients and projects amidst the inequity exposed by coronavirus? Exposed by coronavirus. You can take that one. <laughs> um, I mean, it's a good question. I mean, I think there's always, an, to some extent, an ethical burden of responsibility, um, first as an individual, but then as a, as a practice, which I think 
architects um, should ask themselves more. Um, I mean, I think everything in this kind of post COVID environment is going to be uh, going to be a challenge. You know, um, I mean, I think as a practice, we try to be, uh, you know, to think about diversity as much as possible. Um, we also like to try to call out our blind spots or, or at least be aware that maybe we do have blind spots. Um, so, you know, we're, we're always trying to, um, I think, I think this idea of, of, of collectivity of, of working with others is, is really important. Um, and I think, you know, goes back also to this kind of idea of the local and sort of what it means to kind of like, you know, work within your city, work within your context, work within your neighborhood, work within your street. Um, and I think within that context, there's a lot of people in need. And I think, you know, architects, architecture and as architects, you know, it's, that's one of the, one of the kind of powers and, respons and responsibilities ultimately is to, is to provide, um, you know, a shape and direction to the, to the city in a way that can help people. Um, so I think it takes a lot of awareness, I think, to, to figure out how to navigate. It will take a lot of awareness and to try to figure out how to navigate um, this contest is, is especially. Um, but I think the burden of being ethical was always on the architect. You know, I think now it's just, it's going to be more, it's going to be more challenging because there's going to be more challenges in the near future. Carson from Germany asks, how do you think architects can best contribute in solving the environmental crisis? Hmm. I mean, beyond the obvious um, strategies of sustainability, and um, I think there's, I think there's, cult I think building cultural narratives, which may, um, which may shift the way we relate to um, ecologies. Um, I think there's a lot of conversations about non-human stakeholders, um, that architecture is mostly a humanistic practice. And we come from a, uh, a tradition of the humanities um, so I think the conversations which are emerging about interspeciesism um, are important to understand that humans are part of a larger eco ecological system. Um, so in a way, I think I, I'm interested on, on the level of um, in addition to the concrete things we need to do to increase um, the sustainability of the built environment. Um, uh, personally, I've been learning and researching and trying to understand um, more about indigenous cultures um, and um, what it what it means to relate to the environment in a holistic way where there isn't, um, there isn't even maybe a concept of environment because it's something that is so integral to a way of a, a cosmological um, understanding of one's relationship to, to the world. So in, in a lot of ways, I think there's just these concepts that create these divisions between um, architecture and nature or humans in nature, which um, trickle down to a lot of different uh, assumptions and behaviors and decision-making processes. So um, I think there's some fundamentals uh, about um, the relationship between humans and nature um, that need to be, you know, and are being interrogated. Okay, our last question reads, are your projects the result of design competitions? Is your approach to design and communication different when you take part in a design competition? 
Um, actually, very few of our projects are the result of design competitions. <clears throat> um, I guess a couple of the projects we presented were were proposals. Um, what was the question again? <laughs> About competitions? Yes, uh, I'll just repeat the question again. Are your projects the result of design competitions? Is your approach to design and communication different when you take part in a design competition? Oh, yeah, I guess we try to avoid competitions. Um, they don't make a ton of sense um, as a practice. Um, but I think we're shifting more towards this notion of trying to do more work that's self-generated. I mean, a lot of times early on in our practice, we avoided competitions in favor of doing experiments. And I think um, experiments and prototypes and pilots are more interesting ways for architects to use their resources. Um, that, that also requires communication, um, coalition building, um, because I think it, it means it's a more of a proactive approach to say that here's a way that maybe things could get done in an experimental way, but building partners in order to do that, as opposed to waiting for someone to decide if your idea is good or not um, as, as in a jury. So I think, and that's already, I think, shifting a lot, but I think that's a, a, an, an an approach that I think um, we try to embrace a little bit more is to be more strategic and proactive um, and seeking out projects and doing projects in the world. Okay, so we actually have time for one last question. Um, so it says, Liang Liang was officially certified MBE Minority Business Enterprise last year. How do you feel about initiatives like the Minority Business Enterprise? Is it helping to level the playing field or offer needed support? And that's the last question. Um, yeah, we obviously, we got certified last year. I mean, I think, it, I think it's, I think it's important. I mean, I think there's systemic racial injustice and um, there's systemic injustice in our society. And I do think that in certain situations, um, you know, structures are needed to, um, to create more, um, you know, equal equality or equal playing field, which is 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 the challenge. So, um, you know, I don't on the subject of uh, minority. I mean, I think we um, it's something we also obviously like care a lot about, and the idea of of representation and identity, um, and. But it's not. It's also something that I think doesn't doesn't necessarily define us. Um, but I think it's important to to look into society and see what what's uh, what's where injustice exists and and ways in which we can um, create more um, more equalities in, in 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 different in different sectors of our society. So yeah, I mean, I think fundamentally, if it helps. Um, bring historically marginalized voices to the decision-making table or into situations which would um, otherwise preclude, preclude them, then I think it's positive. Um, you know, like we need more diverse voices at the table to even start to understand what questions haven't been asked and what questions need to be asked. And you can't expect, um, people to be able to speak on behalf of others all the time. People should just, you know, be able to speak for themselves. Um, so. Great. Uh, since that was the last question, I just want to thank uh, you again, Chris and Dominic, for uh, a wonderful uh, talk uh, and agreeing to be part of our NOMAS lecture series. Uh, and the question and answer period was also uh, eye-opening and uh, informative about your approach to architecture. Again, uh, thank you, and I hope everyone uh, has a great evening. Good night. Thank, thank you. you. Good night. Good night.